In the opening moments of our story, we step into the heartwarming world of Shanty Cooper Trones and Dave Trones. Their smiles radiated the joy of newlyweds, asking in the warm glow of their love. It was a time when dreams danced in their eyes and the future held the promise of endless tomorrows. A snapshot of a life filled with dreams and laughter. In 2015, Dave Trones discovered his dream home, a charming house adorned with a fascinating gargoyle located in the upscale neighborhood of Delaney Park in Orlando. The house was beautiful. It was 4,000 square feet. It had a pool, a garage apartment. They sought to infuse a modern aesthetic into the interior, as the house originally boasted an older Victorian style. It didn't take long for Dave and his new wife, Shanty Cooper, to embark on their own remodeling journey. Dave just called me on the phone and asked if I'd come by and take a look at the project. He said that they had done some work. A local contractor says, I wasn't at all prepared for what I saw when I got there. They had fully disassembled this house to a degree that I'd never seen before. It was rather astonishing. It was largely wide open, like you're inside of a giant shoebox. This house became more than just a project to David Tronis. It was his life. He obsessed on it. But as we dig deeper into their story, we discover a different side. This house is the center point to the story and ultimately led to Shanti's demise. Former prosecutor Ryan Veschio says the story began in the late afternoon of April 24th, 2018. Dave placed an emergency call to 911. <laughs> Hello? And David says that he came home and found Shanti floating in the bathtub. My wife is here. I found her way. She's not pretty. The question arises, does that story make sense? Absolutely not. Shanti was extensively beaten. It makes me emotional. I feel bad for her family and for her son. It's upsetting that she won't get that life with him. Upon the arrival of first responders, tragedy struck as Shanti Cooper's life came to a tragic end at the tender age of 39. It became abundantly clear that, right from the outset, Dave Trones was a person of interest in this somber tale. Absolutely. Dave was asked to go to the station Thank you. and voluntarily remain there for hours. And he just started getting confronted and confronted and confronted. He did not request counsel. He consented to swabs, to clippings, to a search of his person. Dave went into that interview with an agenda. Think about where you want to be in the future. You still have a future. Now's your opportunity to make it the best do you, it can do you, be. Do you want to elaborate on that? What do you mean? What do you mean? You still have a future. You still have a life to live. You're still breathing. You're a young man. You still have the rest of your life to live. I can't tell you what's going to happen to you. I don't know because you're not telling the truth. I can tell you that she's a lead detective in this. And if you maintain this BS, she has one, one choice to go with. I told you she was murdered. And it became a war of wills in that room. I don't have any explanation for her, the severity of her injuries. It seems Dave was not broken. And didn't Dave win that war of wills? Well, Dave didn't confess. Seems pretty clear. These two detectives, they went into this room, decided that David was a murderer, and then went the extra mile to try to put a file together to prove such. Did you guys get into an argument? Was she about the house? The question arises again. Is it possible that without this house, Shanty might still be alive. I think that's completely true. This is the most chilling case you've ever heard. But before we go further, let me take you back to the beginning. Shanty Cooper, a successful businesswoman born in 1979, had a son named Jackson Cooper from her first marriage with James Cooper. While not much is known about their marriage, 
things took a sour turn due to James's violent nature, leading to their divorce in 2013. Determined to create a better life, Shanti packed up her things and moved with Jackson to the vibrant city of Orlando. There, she continued working from the comfort of her own home, pouring her heart and soul into being the best single mother she could be. While Shanti showered Jackson with love and happiness, deep down, she longed for a life partner who could share her journey and provide the fatherly love her son deserved. In March 2013, in the pursuit of love, Shanti took a leap of faith and joined Match.com, a dating site where destiny awaited her with open arms. There, Shanti crossed paths with a man named Dave Trons from the distant land of Minnesota. Like Shanti, he was recovering from the aftermath of a divorce from his ex-wife Carol, whom he'd married in 1999. He too yearned for a life partner to share his joys and sorrows. Despite being separated by miles, their connection blossomed through heartfelt letters and late-night phone calls. Surprisingly, in a short span of time, they grew incredibly close and decided to embark on a new relationship together. After just five months, in September 2013, Dave made a bold move and relocated from Minnesota to Orlando to be with Shanti and her son. It was a beautiful time for Shanti, as she found happiness and companionship in Dave's presence, filling her heart with joy. However, in April 2015, a significant change came into their lives when Dave decided to purchase a stunning 4,000-square-foot house in Delaney Park. This neighborhood was known for its elegance and was conveniently located just a mile away from downtown Orlando. Dave bought the house outright, using his own money that he'd accumulated through his past successes in business and real estate. They both instantly fell in love with the neighborhood and the house itself. However, they wanted to give the interior a much more modern touch since the house had an older Victorian style. Together, they agreed that Shanti would take charge of funding the renovations to transform the house into their dream home, since Dave bought the house with his own money. It was an exciting project that they embarked on as a team, bringing their unique ideas and vision to life. But here's where things took an unexpected turn in their story. The renovation project wasn't just about sprucing up the house. There was something more to it. As time went on, their lives started to become more complicated. Despite the challenges, they decided to tie the knot and got married on February 22, 2017. However, after the wedding, the renovation project spiraled out of control. They completely stripped down the interior of the house, and Shanti had already paid a whopping $250,000. The end seemed nowhere in sight, and the house had turned into a chaotic construction zone. It became unbearable to live in, so they had to temporarily move into a small apartment above the garage, leaving the main house behind. It was a frustrating and challenging time for Shanti, and their once happy family life was now disrupted. That's when everything changed dramatically on April 24th, 2018, at around 4 p.m. It was during this moment that Dave made a fateful call to 911, setting the stage for a whole new chapter in our story. <laughs> Hello? And David says that he came home and found Shanti floating in the bathtub. My wife is here. I saw my wife. She's not pretty. We've explored her life, delved into her past, and now we're about to enter the crime scene. After the 911 call, the police arrived at East Copeland Drive in about 20 minutes and met 47-year-old Dave Trons, the person who made the call. When he saw the police, he couldn't hold back his tears and started crying. The police found the lifeless body of 39-year-old Shanti Cooper in the living room, but the reasons behind her death remained mysterious. As they delved deeper into the investigation, they uncovered unsettling evidence, marks on her neck that raised suspicion and traces of blood scattered throughout the house. Among the evidence, what caught their attention was the unusual behavior of Dave during their conversations with him. He seemed to switch between different emotions when discussing his wife's death, which raised suspicions. However, these were only initial observations, and the police needed more information to understand what had happened. They asked Dave to come to the police station for questioning, reassuring him that it was just a routine part of the investigation. The police hoped this would help them gather more clarity about the situation. At this time, Dave had the option to say no because he was not being arrested. However, he willingly decided to go to the Orlando Police Department for questioning. After knowing the crime scene, get ready to be captivated as we dive into the chilling interrogation. Stay tuned and watch closely. It's about to get intense. The detectives would start their investigation by gathering and analyzing all the evidence found at the house and by talking to Dave. 
Their initial priority was to build a rapport with Dave, which meant creating a connection and making him feel supported. The purpose was to ensure that Dave felt comfortable and didn't choose to exercise his right to remain silent or his right to ask for a lawyer. Establishing this connection is crucial in any interrogation because it encourages the suspect to share all information willingly. Hey. Hey. I'm Detective Sprague. Can I get your first name? First name is David. David? Okay. Um, we're going to grab another chair. Okay. Did you need something? Or? I was just asking for a bottle of water. Okay, so we can grab you. Thank you. Have you been to the restroom? I just want to. You just want to? Okay, how about anything else? Anything else? I've been starving a cracker or just something. You just need just both. Salt, right? Just something, just something simple. Just because like, I have a salt teams or peanut butter crackers Anything like that? Okay, yeah. that's not yeah. a problem. Um, we'll be right back. Okay. And is there anything else we can get you? Okay, all right. Okay, I'm going to cover things. Thank you. Okay, is that good? Okay. Okay. All right. I'm with you. I haven't eaten since this morning. I'm sorry this is taking so long. Um, you are David, I believe? Okay, all right. I'm Detective Teresa Sprague, and this is Detective Barb McClelland. Um, first of all, on behalf of the Atlanta Police Department, we want to say how sorry we are for your loss, um, David. And also for everything that you're going through. I know this is very traumatic, traumatic for you. Okay. Um. This emotional outburst seemed odd when considering the timeline. Such a reaction could be genuine, but it occurred about five hours after the 911 call, making it less typical for an innocent person to accept the situation outright. Normally, they might show signs of denial or confusion. Moreover, Dave's reaction appeared prompted by the detective's statement, which didn't make sense since he already knew what had happened hours ago. This raised doubts about the authenticity of his concerns, and it almost felt like a fake display of emotions, not typical of genuine human reactions. It's essential to understand that unusual body language or reactions don't necessarily mean guilt. They require careful analysis. We'll analyze the situation, but we won't jump to conclusions without solid evidence as the real reason behind the unusual behavior may be revealed later in the video. And it's just a terrible, terrible thing. So, what time is it, you know? It's 21, 15, 15, okay. All right, and I know you've been waiting a long time. We've just obviously had a lot to do. Um, to try and figure out what's going on here, okay? And we need your help doing that, okay? Of course. Right, can we just, um, and if you need to take a break, you tell me, okay? okay? If you need anything at all, you let me know, okay? Okay. okay. Um, we appreciate your patience. I know you've been in this suit. I, and I can get you some clothes as well. Um, you understand why we need to do what we need to do? Of course, okay. of course. It's cool. And I, and I we want to. My understanding is that you've been very cooperative, so um, we just need to, obviously we need you, or we got to figure this out together, okay? Of course. What is your uh, first name? Is it is your first name David? It's David uh, M. for Michael. Trons, T-R-O-N-N-E-S. T-R-O-N-N-E-S, okay. And what is your date of birth? 629-68. Okay. Um, how tall were you, David? 6'2". Okay, and how much do you weigh? Okay, blonde or brown hair? Little, little. Little. Okay. Okay. Um, hazel eyes, maybe? Take hazel. Blue, hazel. Okay. <laughs> They're dirty. Yeah. Okay. okay. Just 90 seconds ago, Dave was deeply distressed and crying uncontrollably over his wife's death. Now, he was suddenly chuckling and engaging in friendly banter with the detective even sharing a genuine smile as he talked about his eye color. This quick shift in emotions is not typical of a traumatized suspect, as it's unusual for someone who just experienced a tragic loss to display such contrasting behavior. In the next 60 seconds, you'll witness the emotional switches that were mentioned earlier. Dave went from being calm to suddenly appearing deeply distraught, and then back to being calm again, all within a short span of time. These abrupt changes in emotions suggest that he might be trying to force an emotional reaction that didn't come naturally. In contrast, genuine emotions are less likely to show such drastic shifts. With the addition of visual cues from the video, 
We now have more information to make a better judgment about Dave's true feelings during the interrogation. Oh, in 2013. Okay. About five months after I mentioned to you. Did you meet her here or there? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. I'm so sorry. Take your time. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Can you tell me what year that was? It was 2013. 2013 is when you met online? Yeah. Okay. And about five months later, did you move here and move in with her or just move here? I have, so, um, I'm not sure if it is accurate as possible. I believe it was the end of September. My mom moved down. So you guys knew each other approximately five years this month? At this moment, the detective felt assured about the rapport she'd established with Dave, whether his emotional outburst was genuine or not. It was the right time to move the conversation towards getting him to talk more openly. She proceeded to read him his rights before continuing with the interrogation. Um, obviously, we don't know what happened in your home today, okay? Um, we don't know what happened to Shanti yet. Um, we know you called us, which is good, okay? And we know that, obviously, she's lost her life, okay? Um, so, we do need to, you're, you're not under arrest, okay? I want you to understand that, okay? But we do need to read you your rights because you are in a police department. with two detectives in this room and you've been here for quite some time, okay? And I want you to understand that. Um, we're just trying to figure out what happened to her, okay? And so it's, it's our job to do that, obviously, and we want to give you answers, her son answers. I mean, her family deserves that. Would you agree? Okay. Of course. Okay. So if you don't, I know you've probably never been through anything like this in your life, okay? And I'm going to help you get through it. So if you have questions, you want to stop me, please do so, okay? Um, but I do need you to understand your rights before we ask you about anything that happened in that home today. Do you have the right to remain silent? Do you understand that? I'm sorry? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Anything you say may be used against you in court. Do you understand that? Yes. You have a right to talk to a lawyer before and during questioning. Do you understand that? Yes. In this clip, you listen to Dave agreeing to talk after being read his rights. The most challenging part of the interrogation was over. The focus now was to let Dave speak as freely as possible. Any inconsistencies in his narrative would be carefully examined, along with any evidence found at the house or on Shanti's body, to piece together the truth of what had happened. In the next clip, you'll hear about the renovation project of the new house and how significant it was for Dave. But it turned out that Shanti struggled with it, and their marriage wasn't as idyllic as it appeared on the surface. I... I bought the house with cash that I had. We don't have a note. Um, and I've used mostly my cash that I had saved um, from a career at 3M before I came here. Um, a pretty successful long career, and I did well in real estate um, as well. So I came down here with about 800 or 900,000. We bought the house for cash. Well, how much did, what did the house cost? 608. 
so that you guys own the house free and clear. Um, is your name only on it, or was it both of yours? When we bought the house, we weren't married, and so we put it in a trust, and we just completed the trust paperwork um, end of last year, beginning of this year, to put her name on the trust, and slowly kind of migrate my mom. She's 82, um, off of it. Um, for financial reasons and um, estate planning reasons. Just made more Your sense. mom's name was on the trust? Correct. Okay. And what was the reason for that? Was it you and your mom or just your mom? Um, the reason was if anything would happen, we put her trailer in the trust as well. So it was a property trust for our, our family. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm an only child. Mm -hmm. And um, my father isn't, isn't uh, part of, has been part of my life. So, um, We've always done everything like that together. Okay. I've always taken care of her. Okay. Um, she lives she here? Cares. She does. Okay. Yeah. In the same area or complex that her grandmother, that Shanti's grandmother lives yeah. in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's called Gulfstream Harbor. Gulfstream it's Harbor. Uh, Hoffner and Old Goldenrod. Okay. Um, so you started to put Shanti's name on the home at the end of last year, beginning of this year. Was that process completed or no? Um, we got the trust documentation back from LegalZoom. We do, we do all of our legal documents ourselves. And um, the only thing left to do is to notarize it. We weren't sure because she's also an only child. Uh, and Jackson is an only child. And we didn't know who to put if something happened to both of us. So um, we, had, we had kind of talked about it and debated it. And... Um, and we finally just said it doesn't really matter. Let's just move forward. That's the most important thing. And then, Even after this, Shanti agreed to pay for the renovations, thinking that her contribution would make her an equal partner in the house ownership. However, her name was never added to the trust, meaning that if they were to separate, Shanti wouldn't be entitled to anything, despite investing a lot of money in the renovations. In Florida, properties are divided equally in a divorce if they're considered marital property acquired during the marriage. But since the house was bought and put into a trust before they got married, it was considered non-marital property and wouldn't be divided equally in a divorce. It could be a coincidence that things happen this way. Or it could raise questions about Dave's long-term plans for Shanty and the fairness of the property situation in their relationship. Paid for, we have the money for the renovation in savings ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, we did a calculation on Saturday, I think it was, but we've always, always wanted to come true. So um, there's no way we could ever. She has um, really severe sleep apnea. Um, one of the other things with the appendectomy and the nausea and all the stuff that has come after the surgery is her sleep. Many, many, many times her sleeping has been difficult. She's she, a, when you say she's sleep apnea, does she stop breathing? Does she snore? Does she have a CPAP? What, what do you... All of the above. She has a CPAP, but she doesn't use it um, because she can't sleep with it. It keeps her awake. Um, so she sleeps without it, um, but she snores a lot and she wakes up frequently. So where would you sleep? I sleep downstairs. In the video clip, Dave mentioned that he slept downstairs to give Shanti and her son privacy when he came over, but also because Shanti snored. When Dave said he slept downstairs, he was actually referring to the garage, which seemed like an unusual choice unless there were other issues at play. The detective found this strange because the couple was renovating their house and the current living space was small, yet they didn't sleep together. This raised suspicion for the detective that there might have been pre-existing problems between Shanti and Dave before her death. In the next clip, the detective asked Dave about his recollection of the day he found Shanti dead. How much? Mm -hmm. Is that what your recollection is? Okay. What time did you get up? Um, I woke up before seven. So you leave approximately 
take the dogs in the white Toyota RAV4 to the Park of Americas on Andes so far? Correct. Okay. Um, do you holler up, text her, tell her you're leaving, any communication? I didn't. You didn't? Um, so you're assuming she's home because the car's there, mm -hmm. and you had already mentioned you were going to do this, so you did not communicate about your that you were leaving. No, she knew. She knew. Um, so in your mind, she's there. No? no. When was the last time you had telephone, text, on a, a Facebook, any sort of communication via phone with Sean The day before when she told me Jim was coming early to get Jackson. Now I'm concerned that she wasn't okay when I left. Now you're concerned she wasn't okay when you left? Talking about it's hard because you're asking me if we communicated and we were pretty efficient in the morning. She tells me, you know, what she's got planned for the day. I tell her what I have planned. We work on it. We do our little morning strategy session, and then it's who's going to pick up Jackson and what time. So we race through our day to some degree to make sure that we get everything done. And then okay. And I wish I would have taken the time to check on her. Okay. What? So you, you think you made it to the park before noon or after? Um, just shortly after. Is anyone with you? Just the dogs. Just the dogs? Okay. Do you see anyone at the park that you know? I don't. I have two dogs, so I typically, um... Dave stated that he had no contact with Shanti throughout the day, which seems strange considering they lived together. He mentioned that he simply woke up and didn't feel the need to check on his wife before going out with the dogs. The detective found this story puzzling, as nothing seemed to add up. In the next clip, you'll notice that Dave went into excessive detail about irrelevant topics. This is a common tactic used by manipulators to overwhelm the listener with so much information that it becomes challenging to distinguish between facts and fiction. Such behavior can raise doubts about the truthfulness of the information provided. Forested, it's pretty gnarly, but I don't, there's a lot of unstable dogs and there's almost always fights. Then there's a small dog area next to that. I tend to work the dogs there. If there's nobody around in a lot of times, that's another reason for going that time of the day is there's usually very few people there. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a big field off of that between a little reservoir. I think it's a lake. It's just a little reservoir with a walkway around it. And it's a big field between the playground, the lake, and the small dog park. And uh, that's where I bring Charlie and Dawn. Okay. And um, so you kind of let them run, do their thing, enjoy the park. How long do you think you were there? Um, we were working pretty hard. I think it was an hour and 45 minutes because I don't think I got home until 2. Did you have communication on your phone with anyone in that hour and 45 minutes? No. Did you text anyone, call anyone? Were you on Facebook, commenting, liking, posting? I don't do that. You don't do that? Okay. So you don't think you, was your phone with you? Um, I take a, um, a blue, I have a little blue cooler bag, and I could just leave the phone in there, but I didn't text or call anybody. I, I missed that. You said you have a blue but cooler bag? When I, when I go, I, t I took a I take all my personal belongings and I put them in there. So I put the water bottle in there. I put the keys in there when I'm out in the park with the dogs. Gotcha. And my phone. And um, I usually bring a treat for the dogs. Okay. Uh, reward treats for the dogs. If a suspect is intentionally trying to show a specific emotion, like grief, it becomes difficult for them to shift their focus while maintaining that emotion. Pretending to feel a certain way takes a lot of mental effort 
making it hard to switch attention to other things and keep up the act. For instance, if someone is pretending to be sad, they might struggle to show that emotion while explaining complex details. On the other hand, if a person is genuinely distraught, their emotions will likely remain constant, regardless of how much they need to focus on other things. Genuine emotions don't require conscious effort, making them more stable and reliable indicators of a person's feelings. During the interrogation, the detective asked an open-ended question about Dave coming back to the house. If Dave was innocent, he would probably focus on his wife Shanty, as coming home to find a deceased loved one is highly traumatic. However, instead of discussing Shanty, Dave provided excessive details about irrelevant things like plans and upcoming construction projects. This diversion tactic suggests that he wanted to shift the attention away from Shanty. Notice the time it took for Dave to finally mention Shanty. Um, I feed them. Um, and Sunday I had moved a couple of plants. And I went out um, to check on them because it rained really, really hard last night. Um, the bougainvillea in the driveway was, when it rains heavy like that, it sags down so you can't drive in. So I took the pool brush on the end of a pole and I push it back to get it back up and in there, kind of locked in. Um, we have construction starting in a couple of weeks, so I'm cleaning the courtyard in front of the greenhouse. Um, I cleaned up some of the bougainvillea that I trimmed, put them in a wastebasket. Um, I flipped the pool pump on. Um, I cleaned the pool out again leaves and scrubbed it. So you cleaned the pool twice and you fed the dogs twice. You fed them in the morning and you fed them again when you got home. Mm -hmm. And you cleaned the pool when you woke up and you cleaned it again when you got home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Um, as I said, I worked in the yard. I worked in the driveway, which is what we call the courtyard. Anybody come by? No. Mailman, delivery folks, friends, neighbors. No. No one came over. No. Okay. Um. So you're out in front by that dumpster. Is that the courtyard? Yeah, but the, where we park back. In front, what, in front of the garage door. Of, the, that's the courtyard. With the, with the clean house and, that and when you say you were cleaning the courtyard, what what's, what what do what you recall doing? Um, there was a bunch of wood that had, uh, some two by fours that had been sitting out there, and some pieces of plywood um, that I had moved when it started raining. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of leaves that had fallen from the trees behind. Uh, from ours, but from the other side of the wall, basically our, our neighbor back then. So I had um, swept that up. Um, I had done some of that on Sunday, and I did probably another 20 or 30 minutes of that um, around the greenhouse uh, in front of the vehicles, um, back by the pallets. Um, we were going to move the greenhouse so we could put a lumber pile in for framing. Back there, and I was trying to figure out where I was going to move everything. Okay. Um, so you think you worked in the yard until how many minutes do you believe that was, or hours? I would say less than an hour, but close to more than 45 minutes to an hour, somewhere in there. So you're closer to three-ish? Yeah, I guess after three. Okay, and then what do you do? Um, that's all that I can remember until I went upstairs to see my moving so. Okay. When you enter the 
garage apartment. So um, I could hear the water is running, but it's not running. It's not like the sound of a shower is running. It's just, it's, it's trickling out of the spider, which is weird because, you know, the only time that she does that is um, if she's going to take a shower, she would do that to heat the, the water heaters affixed to the outside of the main house. So it's a long run to get up to that bathroom. There's, so I listen, because um, if she's on the phone with a work call, I don't announce myself. You know, I just walk upstairs. I didn't hear her. And um, I, I could hear the water. I couldn't hear her. I knew something was wrong. Because you heard the water and didn't hear her, you felt something was wrong? I went upstairs. I don't hear her talking on the phone. So I say hello. I don't hear anything bad. I can hear water running. Um, She's not saying anything. doesn't seem right. Sometimes it is hard if you have the water running to hear somebody out there. So that, that was my assumption. Okay, so you, it's one room. You don't see her? Until I get to the bathroom. Okay. Is the bathroom door open or closed? Open. Open. Okay, and so you walk toward the water that you're hearing? Yeah, I walk in the bathroom. Okay. And the door is open, and what happens? What do you see? I see her laying with her head in the right hand corner. The water is running. But I don't think I don't think the drain is closed because it, if it was it would be it would be going over, right? So the water's like half full. She's submerged. In this clip, Dave sought approval for his version of events as if it wasn't a straightforward matter. A truthful suspect would typically state their version of events without seeking approval. Dave recalled the events as if he was asking a question, which is a sign of possible deception. But she's also partially not submerged, and one of her legs is kind of sticking up and out a little bit. And it's just extremely awful, and it doesn't look natural. Obviously, she fell or something happened. She's... She's stiff. Um, it's hard. She's stiff. It's, it's hard to pick her up. She's not. It's like a sack of potatoes. You know, it's not easy. Um, she's not moving with me. I grabbed her arms and kind of pulled her this way um, and over. I think partially onto her her wrist. I thought that. I just don't think that there's something I can do to help. And I'm trying to get, I'm kind of moving here, trying to get her, to shake her a little bit and trying to get the water out of her lungs. I got her in front of the couch and I had to, I had to stop and put her down. And I tried to, to lift her head up to kind of clear like you, I guess it's the thing you do if you're going to do CPR or something. And she's not responding. She has blood coming down her face and on the side of the body. And um, I'm still thinking she's somehow I'm still thinking. I think her head and her his long hair are on it, and it looks like it's in the middle to me. There's two, there's a couple of settings that are fully closed. Okay. So her hair is definitely wet, right? Yeah. Her clothing, her tank, and her shorts are wet. Yeah. Um, and she's face down. So the first thing you do is what, if you recall? I reached out and grabbed. I reached out and, and, and touched. Um, her right arm. Do you recall where? Um, how much time do you 
you think elapsed with everything you attempted to do? I've, I've been thinking about that. Um, it, it took, it probably seems that long. In this clip, things begin to unravel and become clearer. Dave claimed that when he returned home, he found Shanti deceased in the bathroom. He moved her to the living room, and within five or six minutes, he called 911. However, when the police arrived at the house about 20 minutes later, they noticed something odd. According to Dave's description, there should have been water everywhere, and Shanti's body should have been wet. But in reality, the entire house was dry, and there wasn't a single drop of water, not even on Shanti. This indicated that Shanti's body had been out for a long time, and the house had been meticulously cleaned. Struck you? Threw anything at you? No. No. Have you ever harmed her physically? No. Choked her? No. Strangled her? No. No. Have you ever strangled her or choked her during sex just for heightened orgasm? Some couples do that? Absolutely not. No. Absolutely not. Okay. Um, was there ever anything around her neck um, that you noticed during you were moving her from the tub or attempting CPR? Was there any anything around her neck at all? No. Okay. No necklace, no. no nothing. nothing. Okay. Um, did you ever, if in your assessment of her or attempt to help, have your hand on her neck at all? Sure. Under, underneath, behind her. Behind like, her head. Like that. To do then, the head tilt chin lift. Sure. And then also, um, also to feel for the pulse of the region. Okay. Did you ever have your hand on her neck where you would have had to have squeezed it for any reason? Um, possibly when we were... In this footage, the detective mentioned strangulation to see how Dave would respond. The detective had access to the autopsy reports, which revealed that Shanti's cause of death was due to blunt force trauma to the head and strangulation. She didn't drown. In fact, she'd been dead for hours before the investigators arrived. They found that one of Shanti's earrings was missing, and there was blood in the room. Additionally, there were no defensive marks on her body, leading the detectives to believe that she'd been preparing for bed the previous night when she was attacked and strangled to death. To make it appear as an accident, her body was left in the bathtub filled with water. What stood out in Dave's body language was his lack of resistance to these questions. On the same day he discovered his wife dead, an innocent suspect would likely not tolerate being subjected to such questioning. They would probably be furious at the audacity of the detective to ask such questions at such a sensitive time. First of all, you're not really sharing the same residence. You're kind of living downstairs. She's living upstairs with her son. Uh, but her son's not there. So even when her son's not there, you're still not sleeping together. You're not in the same residence. So during, spending, during, during the day, spending just a lot just... of time. And I think whatever happened to her happened before you went to the park. Okay. Do you know how long it takes someone to get stiff? And I think you've left some stuff out. It is maybe something got out of hand. Maybe you didn't mean for it to happen. And when you came back and found her, it's pretty evident that she was deceased. Yeah. Cold, stiff, yeah. significant swelling. Yeah. And a lot of bloating. Great. Okay. So whatever happened between 7 and 9.30 to 9.45, is where I need you to be significantly more honest. Now, if there's an explanation, I want to hear it. I have told you everything. Yeah, but you've left out something, David, because this woman has significant injuries. Okay, this is not in any way. Absolutely not. Did you choke her? Absolutely not. Did you strangle her? Without question, no. Did you beat her? No. Did you hit her with anything? Absolutely not. Okay. Do you have injuries? I do not. Anywhere? Did they photograph you, I assume? They did. Okay. Do you know if they photographed your chest or with or without clothes? 
At this point, the detective was certain that Dave was hiding something crucial, and it was time for a final confrontation. They left Dave alone for about two hours to increase the pressure after the initial confrontation. When the detectives returned, it was past 2 a.m. in the morning. This strategy of exhausting the suspect is commonly used because as physical and mental fatigue sets in, the suspect is more likely to make mistakes and may confess to escape the uncomfortable interrogation environment. Mentally. Yeah. Wow. Detective McCollum just wanted to go over some, some of the points. I know she, I had more of an opportunity to ask questions than she did, so we wanted to just. It was part of your character of who you are by any means. But I know, and you know, that something happened there today that caused this because it didn't happen from a slip and fall in the bathtub. It didn't happen that way. And you know that. And here's the thing. I, I would tell you, I, I have never, ever. And, what and you pick. But one of, the, one of the two things happened. She didn't do this to herself. And there was nobody else there. The detective used a common strategy by posing an alternative question to start unraveling the suspect's narrative. They suggested that an accident might have happened. And if the suspect were to confess to this possibility, then they would dig deeper and challenge if it was really just an accident. What are, what are we supposed to think? You, what you're saying doesn't make sense. You're saying I don't know what happened. So when you pulled her out of the tub, you agreed with me that the water came out of the tub. There's not a spot of water on the floor, David. The carpet isn't wet. The carpet isn't wet from where she was pulled out of the bathtub, sopping wet all the way around to the front of the couch. The carpet's not wet. There's no blood on the carpet. Average person would think if you pull somebody who has been in a tub with long brown hair, who's bleeding in a, what did you call it, a rose-colored water in the tub, and you pull her out, water's going to come splashing out on the floor. So please help us to understand, because... If you maintain what you're saying right now, do you understand that it just looks like you just don't care? Okay. That's not like Scott Peterson, who killed Lacey Peterson, who's got four or five different girlfriends in four different states. Okay? I don't think that's who David is. I think David made a mistake. And I don't think David needs to pay as severely as someone like Scott Peterson. I think David needs to tell the truth. David's going to feel better about that. And then we're going to deal with what that truth is. And we're going to be able to figure it out together. Okay? Okay? That's not like Scott Peterson, who killed Lacey Peterson, who's got four or five different girlfriends in four different states. Okay? I don't think that's who David is. I think David made a mistake. Who didn't really care for this woman. Who didn't love her. Who married her because maybe she had potential to make really good money. Or had some money. Or maybe for the life insurance. Who knows? I mean, that's what people are going to think. Unless we are able to say the truth. But it's one or the other, Dave. You either you either made a mistake. You're a cold boy killer. Which one are you? Dave. Isn't a 
mistake? You don't know that? Common sense would tell you if you pull a woman soaking wet out of a tub at 3 o'clock and call the police within six minutes, then everything will be soaking wet when the police arrive within three minutes of that. That's common sense. So how did everything dry up? That's our question. Because she happened? wasn't pulled out at 3 o'clock. It didn't happen. There's a science behind evaporation, <clears throat> and that science is not matching. It's not the, magic. Three okay. o'clock. I can take a shower at six thirty in the morning, and at ten o'clock at night, my towel's still wet. The shower even stays wet. That's the sliver of truth. There's blood in the water. There's another sliver of truth. Mm -hmm. I know you think you thought of everything, but you didn't. I don't think I thought of everything. I've, just, I've told you over and over, I don't know. You do know. You have to stop saying you don't know, because you do know. You do. David. You do know. You know exactly what happened. Because it was only you and her there. There was nobody else there. Because I'm telling you right now, nobody is going to believe that. Nobody. Like, as it's picked apart by every, as, it, as everything you told us is picked apart by everyone who testified. And we haven't even hit on everything. We're waiting, we're holding something back, waiting to hear the truth. People can be sympathetic when they hear people be honest and remorseful. They can be empathetic to a situation that gets out of hand. I can't tell you what's going to happen to you. I don't know because you're not telling the truth. I can tell you that she's a lead detective in this. And if you maintain this BS... She has one, one choice to go with. The narrative I choose to write. Based on the facts that we know. Right. Whether it's true or not. But it's what we have. You don't want me to surmise what happened, do you? Just based on evidence? Testimony? You want me to tell your truth, or do you want to tell your truth? Because if I tell you truth, it's probably going to be first degree, premeditated, and I'll make you probably look like I am. I don't think that's fair, but you don't, you're not leaving me a lot of choice. Okay. And then what happens? You face the music. Which is? You face the music. Face a jury of your peers. You gotta understand, we're in control of the narrative here. You and I, Detective McConnell, are in control of the narrative here. We're gonna know the truth when we hear it. David, we've been doing this a really long time. Okay, we're gonna know the truth when we hear it. It's gonna match what we already know. And solve this case. And I'm glad you think that's funny. I'm glad you think that's funny. I'm glad you think that's funny. Okay. Because every time you smirk and smile, okay, that's going to be seen as well. And what do you think? What happened? What happened between you and her? The detectives tried to get a confession from Dave, but their efforts didn't work. They kept asking questions repeatedly, but Dave continued to insist that he was innocent. In the end, they had to stop the interrogation 
and Dave was allowed to leave because nothing he said could be used against him. The detectives were not happy with the outcome since their main goal was to get a confession. However, this interrogation marked the beginning of the investigation into Dave as the primary suspect. In the following months after the interrogation, the investigators looked into other possible suspects. Shanty's ex-husband, Jim, was interviewed and asked about his whereabouts on April 24, 2018. He had a strong alibi, so he was ruled out as a suspect. The investigators also spoke to Shanty's friends, who revealed that even though Dave bought the house, it was always Shanty who paid for everything, even the small expenses of running the house. Dave didn't contribute financially. After two months of investigation, the detectives discovered that Dave was a member of a place called Club Orlando, which is a same-gender bathhouse. A witness claimed to have seen Dave involved in activities with other men at the club. Shanty's friends and family strongly believed that she wouldn't have tolerated this, suggesting that Dave was leading a double life, hiding his actions from Shanty. During the search of their house, they found Shanty's engagement ring, which had been stolen months before, in Dave's possession. This indicated that Dave was the one who stole it, and it raised suspicions about his intentions from the beginning. In addition, they found Shanty's diary, which confirmed her feelings of sadness, loneliness, and fear, expressing her desire to break free from the life she'd built. I don't feel mentally healthy at this time, and a lot of the poor and unhealthy feelings are due to our interactions. I never feel like I do anything right. Unless I'm being perfect, I've ruined your day, your life. Another day of crying. Another day of being depressed and asking myself what I'm doing wrong. Oh, the answer is to be nice. In a note dated March 2016, Shanti had written a list of her complaints about Dave. She felt he was lying about being wealthy and never paid for anything. Even when it was his turn to pay for dinner, he'd claim he forgot his wallet. She was also unhappy about the ongoing renovations to their home, which forced them to live in the garage apartment. The letters found by the detectives supported their belief that money and problems with the house renovation might have been reasons for Dave to kill Shanti. Dave was eventually arrested four months later in August 2018 and charged with first-degree murder for the death of Shanti Cooper. The trial for Dave Trons was scheduled to begin on February 3, 2020, but was delayed several times due to the COVID pandemic and health issues that David had. Finally, in January 2021, the trial started, and it was the first time Jackson, Shanti's son, saw Dave in person since his arrest. Jackson mentioned that Dave looked terrible and wasn't doing well. During the trial, both the defense and prosecution discussed Dave's mental state. They agreed that he was not mentally fit to proceed with the trial and recommended that he be committed for evaluation. The trial was delayed again and set for September 2023. Currently, Dave is still in prison waiting for his trial. Despite the delays, it's widely believed that Dave is responsible for Shanty Cooper's death and he can't escape the consequences. The interrogation of Dave Trons revealed a web of lies, deceit, and hidden secrets. As detectives skillfully peeled back the layers of Dave's narration, inconsistencies, and emotional switches, it painted a haunting picture of a potential murderer. It shows how important it is to conduct thorough and insightful interrogations in cases like this. What are your thoughts on this case? Was Dave Trons really responsible in Shanty Cooper's murder? We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comment section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.